All right, guys, welcome back to the next lecture. Before we move into questions on the obstructive and restrictive lung diseases, I want you to take a look at the following image in your books, um, or, the, or the similar image in your books, and I want to do a quick review just so that you're comfortable understanding what's going on here. So remember, you do not need to memorize this stuff. Just remember what's happening and you can figure it out. So if we think back to our lung volume capacity charts, remember that our vital capacity is our normal breath. No deep inhale, no deep exhale. The RV is the residual volume, which remember is the amount of air always left in the lungs that cannot be exhaled, even with a deep exhale. Now in obstructive lung diseases, the big picture to remember is that we've got a reduction in the airflow. Whereas in restrictive lung diseases, we've got a reduction in lung volume. Think of it this way. In obstructive lung diseases, we have difficulty getting the air out. In restrictive lung diseases, we have difficulty getting the air in. I always visualize a lung that has a restrictive mobility when I think of restrictive lung diseases. That really helps me to remember that anything that basically prevents the lungs from expanding properly falls into this category. Also, with the obstructive lung diseases, I always remember that those alveoli associated with emphysema and um, how they're broken down and they can't recoil, I always sort of picture that. Um, and it reminds me that in COPDs, you're gonna struggle to exhale that air as a result of that, of that damage. Now, that may or may not help you. You might be thinking, what, am, what the heck is Dr. Paul saying? It's just a couple of visuals that I keep in mind when I'm thinking restrictive versus obstructive. I look at an alveolus in my head that's all kind of like, you know, worn out and it doesn't have that, that, that ability to recoil. Um, that's just, if it helps you, it helps you. If not, you know, hopefully you find another way. But with that said, if we consider an obstructive lung disease, the loop shifting to the left here, this indicates a higher volume that's left in the lungs with a much lower expiratory volume and an inspiratory volume that is less severely affected. So if you consider the restrictive loop here, remember that we're restricting flow into the lung. So overall, there's a drop in the total inspired volume, and there's a significant drop in both inspiration and expiration volumes, which makes sense, right? If you're taking less in, of course there's gonna be less going out. Whereas in obstructive, you can take it normally, but you're holding on to more air. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So if you consider those big picture elements, when we consider the residual volume, it makes sense that in obstructive lung diseases, when we have trouble exhaling, our residual volume would increase, and vice versa with the restrictive lung diseases. Now, if we look at FRC, which is the functional, the functional residual capacity, which remember is the volume of gas left in the lungs after a normal expiration, what do you think happens to this value in a COPD, knowing what we just discussed? Well, the concept tells us that in obstructive lung diseases, it should be elevated, and in restrictive lung diseases, it should be decreased, which if you look at the chart in your books, is exactly what it says. But if you understand the big picture, we can actually figure this out on our own. Now, the same thing with total lung capacity. In obstructive lung diseases, we know that total lung capacity is increased while in restrictive, it is decreased. Now, the last conceptual thing to remember is that of the FEV1 to FVC ratio. Now, this, is the, this ratio is the measurement of the air that you can forcefully exhale from your lungs. Now, FEV1 is that volume over one second. So if you take a deep breath and you just expel air quickly, FEV1 is the amount you can get out in one second. FVC, which is forced vital capacity, is the full amount that you can breathe out with, um, with some effort. So if you inhale and you breathe out hard, what you keep breathing out would be your FVC. So obviously, if you forcefully exhale in one second, you're gonna get a good chunk of that air out. Because in obstructive lung diseases, we hold on to more air, that numerator is larger, and thus the ratio is decreased. In restrictive lung diseases, however, the ratio is either normal or slightly increased. But typically, the FEV1 and the FVC decrease proportionally because remember, the problem's more so getting air into the lungs as a whole, not getting it out. Now that we've got a, or that we did a review of that and hopefully you know that freshens this concept or these concepts in your mind, let's get started and let's start with a matching exercise. So I want you to hit the pause button, figure this out, and then come on back and we will discuss these different conditions.
right, here are the correct answers. If you need to fix anything, go ahead, hit the pause button and do so. Otherwise, let's take a look at our obstructive lung diseases. Now, remember, as a whole, these are all going to be associated with some degree of airflow obstruction that results in the trapping of air in the lungs and subsequently elevated lung volumes. And remember, we'll see a decrease in our FEV1 to FVC ratio because that FEV1 drops more than anything else. First up, we have bronchitis. Now this is a condition caused by hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the mucus secreting glands in the bronchi. Now this leads to the telltale findings that include wheezing, crackles, cyanosis, dyspnea, CO2 retention, and polycythemia. Now there's something known as the Reed Index, which is a commonly tested concept and is a measure of mucus gland proliferation, whereby we look at and compare the thickness of the mucus glandular layer versus the distance from epithelium to the level of the cartilage. Normally, this ratio is under 0.4, but in chronic bronchitis, it's actually greater than 0.5, or 50%. Now remember, the diagnosis is based on the finding of a productive cough for three or more months in a single year that occurs for at least two years in a row. Emphysema is up next. And remember, this is classically associated with that barrel-shaped chest. As such, the chest x-ray is typically going to demonstrate an increased AP diameter with flattening of the diaphragm and increased lung field lucency. Now patients with emphysema demonstrate what is known as pursed lip breathing. That's done to increase airway pressure and prevent airway collapse. Now we need to recognize a couple variations of this condition. We have uh, sentry assignar and pan assignar types. So let's take a quick look at those. So in the sentry assignar emphysema, this affects the respiratory bronchioles, but not the distal alveoli pan assignar emphysema affects both. Now the classic US Emily question about the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is associated with which one of these? That would be the pan assignar emphysema. Now remember, if you see emphysema in a young person who doesn't smoke, always be thinking about the possibility of an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Now pan assignar emphysema is more common in the lower lobes Sentry assignar is seen more commonly in the upper lobes and is more commonly and strongly linked to smoking. Asthma is next, and asthma is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, and this is of course characterized by bouts of wheezing, tachypnea, coughing, dyspnea, hypoxemia, and a decreased inspiratory to expiratory ratio. Now this is typically triggered of course by things like allergens, stress, exercise, and one thing to keep in mind is that the uh, wheezing is typically seen on expiration. Now, what happens in asthma is that the bronchi become hyper-responsive to these triggers and then bronchoconstriction happens. Now, some of the most often tested links to asthma, um, especially on your exam, are to the histologic findings, which includes hypertrophy and hyperplasia of smooth muscle, uh, the presence of charcoal-laden crystals, which are these eosinophilic hexagonal double-pointed crystals that are formed from the breakdown of eosinophils in the sputum, and the third is the Kirschman spirals. Kirschman spirals are the name given to the epithelium that breaks down and forms these whorled mucus plugs. Now remember that a suspected diagnosis of asthma can be supported with both spirometry or the methicoline challenge. Finally, we have bronchiectasis. This is a condition caused by chronic necrotizing infection of the bronchi or obstruction resulting in the permanent dilation of the airways. Now patients will typically present with recurring infections and most commonly that is as a result of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. They also present with hemoptysis, uh, purulent sputum seen every single day, and digital clubbing. Now I want you to be on the lookout for this in association with cystic fibrosis or genetic conditions that affect ciliary function such as Cartagena syndrome and of course bronchial obstruction. All right, let's move on to the next question. We have another matching exercise for you here, so go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. All right, here are the correct answers. If you have to fix anything, go ahead and do so. Otherwise, hopefully you got this one right uh, because we just talked about how to logically think about obstructive versus restrictive lung diseases. But in case you forgot, remember that something uh, that some of the main findings associated with restrictive lung diseases include a decrease in FBC, TLC, and overall lung volumes, 
a normal or slightly increased FEV1 to FEC ratio. Remember though, this is off normal because the ratio is actually unchanged and patients will breathe with short, shallow breaths. Now, there are many possible causes of restrictive lung diseases, including actual diseases affecting the lungs like pulmonary fibrosis, pneumocodiosis, sarcoidosis, etc. Now, these lung specific or these lung tissue specific diseases are typically going to lead to a decrease in DLCO. DLCO is the diffusing capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide. This measures the lung's ability to transfer from air to the red blood cells in the pulmonary capillaries. And you also see an increase in AA gradient. Now, I'm not going to walk you through every single possible cause of parenchymal lung disease causing restrictive findings. But one thing that I do want to point out is radiation-induced lung injury and this is associated with the development of pro-inflammatory cytokines that are released, and it's associated with a dry cough, with dyspnea, and a low-grade fever. Now, acute radiation pneumonitis is seen anywhere from three to 12 weeks afterwards, while radiation fibrosis may be seen from six to 12 months after the therapy. The other possible cause of restrictive lung disease is an alteration in our ability to breathe. So really anything that slows your breathing, like neurologic diseases, drug use, structural abnormalities, can be the culprit behind this restrictive lung disease pattern. Now, since this isn't actually a lung tissue specific pathology, the AA gradient and DLCO are both going to be normal in that condition. All right, let's move on to a multiple choice question. Go ahead, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is C. So hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a condition that results from the reaction to environmental changes. That reaction is a mixed type 3 and type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. Usually you'll see this in farmers and people who handle birds on a regular basis. And the main findings include an acute onset of dyspnea, cough, chest tight, tightness, uh, fever, and headache. Now typically, once the cause of the symptoms is removed, patients will get better. However, if that stimulus doesn't get removed, Patients may develop irreversible fibrosis with non-caseating granulomas, alveolar septal thickening, and traction bronchiectasis. The other options here in the question, they pertain to either idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, mainly the crackles, and sarcoidosis, uh, which is associated with RA-like arthropathy, Bell palsy, and uveitis. Now let's take a look at both of these conditions. Let's start with idiopathic fibrosis. So this is a condition characterized by progressive fibrosis, and although an exact cause isn't known, it does have a strong tie to a history of smoking, um, to exposure to environmental pollutants and genetic defects. Now patients with this will typically develop progressive dyspnea, fatigue, a non-productive cough, crackles, and clubbing. And imaging in this condition gives us a, a more clear-cut diagnosis. And what you wanna look for here is the presence of peripheral reticular opacities with traction bronchiectasis, and that honeycombing appearance of the lungs in the more advanced stages of the disease. Now, if this does, does not get managed, if it goes unmanaged, then patients eventually expose themselves to complications like pulmonary hypertension, uh, respiratory failure, lung cancer, and even arrhythmias. Now, sarcoidosis is the next topic here, and this is, of course, a very highly tested condition. And remember that this is an immune-mediated condition. It's characterized by the development of widespread granulomas, elevated serum ACE levels, and if we look at the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, you'll see elevated CD4 to CD8 ratios. Now, enlarged lymph nodes is oftentimes the only thing you will find in this patient. And if patients are symptomatic, we can give them steroids. If not, we can typically leave this alone and observe. Now, imaging in sarcoidosis is often positive for bilateral adenopathy and coarse reticular opacities. And if you're asked about the CT findings, you will likely see extensive hilar and mediastinal adenopathy. When it comes to sarcoidosis, you definitely need to remember the possible associations as there are many. So first, watch for Bell's palsy, watch for uveitis, watch for lupus-like skin infections, watch for arthritis symptoms uh, that look similar to RA. Um, you know, those are findings we can visualize. On imaging or labs, Watch for, of course, the non-caseating epithelioid granulomas that contain asteroid and Schaumann bodies. Uh, look for interstitial fibrosis and look for increased serum calcium, which is going to be present due to an increase in the 1-alpha-hydroxylase-mediated activation of vitamin D in macrophages. Now, another common type of injury that you need to be able to recognize in a vignette based on history is the inhalation injury. 
which should really follow inhalation of some sort of noxious stimulus. Uh, it could be things like severe heat, irritants, uh, certain types of particulate. Any patient who is exposed to fires or others, some sort of poisoning or anything, you always want to suspect an inhalation injury. And when suspected, you want to look for bronchoscopy findings that include edema, uh, congestion of the bronchus, and the deposition, deposition of whatever particulate it was that they inhaled. All right, let's move on to the next question. We've got another matching exercise. So go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. All right, here are the correct answers. If you need to fix anything, please go ahead and do so. Otherwise, let's take a look at the pneumoconiosis, which I guarantee you are going to show up on exam day. This stuff is super high yield, commonly tested, so let's take a look. The main conditions we need to worry about are, of course, asbestos, beryllium exposure, coal worker pneumoconiosis, and silicosis. So asbestosis, asbestos, can cause pulmonary fibrosis, pleural disease, and malignancies. And you need to consider this in someone with a history of roofing, shipbuilding, or plumbing. One important key that you need to keep in mind with asbestosis is that it affects the lower lobes and it's characterized by ivory white calcifications and the pathognomonic finding of pleural plaques. While it is more likely to result in bronchogenic carcinoma, it is also associated with mesothelioma. Mesothelioma needs to be recognized on your exam so what you need to consider with this is that it is a malignancy of the pleura and can lead to hemorrhagic pleural fusions and pleural thickening. And on histology, it's associated with somoma bodies. While on electron microscopy, it may demonstrate polygonal tumor cells within the microvilli, desmosomes, and tunnel filaments. One unique differentiating finding that helps you separate mesothelioma from carcinomas is that it is calretinin and cytokeratin 5-6 positive most of the time, whereas that is not found in carcinomas. Now let's get back to asbestosis. So histology is very important. What you want to look for is the presence of those classically asked ferruginous bodies, which are golden brown fusiform rods that are shaped like dumbbells and are found in the alveolar sputum. If you're asked about how we visualize these or they tell you how, remember that it is via the Prussian blue stain. Now, two important consequences to keep in mind with asbestosis is the fact that there's an increased risk of bronchogenic carcinoma and an increased risk of a syndrome known as Kaplan syndrome. This is a condition that's characterized by the presence of RA and pneumoconiosis with intrapulmonary nodules. And one final association with this condition is the increased risk of pleural effusions. Borreliosis is up next, and as opposed to asbestosis, this is going to be found in the upper lobes. Now, beryllium is typically found in manufacturing and aerospace industries, so you want to keep that in mind um, when you're looking, uh, when you're reading through the vignette, because they might just tell you that. Histology is going to be an important indicator to you about what you're dealing with here, so you want to keep an eye out for non-caseating granulomas. Now, two increased risks associated with this condition are the increased risk of cancer and the increased risk of developing core pulmonale. Next up, we have coal workers' pneumoconiosis. This is, of course, caused by prolonged exposure to coal dust. You'll recognize this by the history and by the presence of inflammation and fibrosis that's associated with coal dust-laden macrophages. And on imaging, you'll see small, rounded, nodular opacities. Like beryliosis, this affects the upper lobes. And like asbestosis, this is also associated with an increased risk of Kaplan syndrome. The last condition here is going to affect the upper lobes, and it's associated with sandblasting, foundries, and mines. This is, of course, silicosis. Patients with silicosis develop fibrosis because the macrophages release fibrogenic factors when they're exposed to silica. Now, on x-ray, I want you to look for eggshell calcifications of the hyalur lymph nodes. One of the important questions you might be asked about silicosis is its ability to increase someone's susceptibility to TB. So if you're asked about this, the reason for this is simple. Silica is believed to cause a disruption in the function of phagolysosomes and macrophages. This results in a decreased ability to ward off TB. In addition to the increased susceptibility to TB, patients with silicosis are also at an increased risk of developing cancer, Kaplan syndrome, and core pulmonale. All right, let's take a quick break there, and then I will see you guys on the next lecture.